Howdy doodly gamerinos and welcome to the Academy World Championship Finals you guys. We've got two of the most decorated Academy rosters ever battling out for your entertainment later today but my name is Joshua Joshi Howard and let's find out what it is I'm actually working with today. Oh, it's a copy on Rebel Fox. Well, at least on the price side, Cubby, I heard you got a plus two recently in golf, was it? Yeah, you know, you got to balance out the Zoomer sports with the Boomer sports. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, find some good golf on the links and kind of have to see if any of these teams can uh, take it to five today. As we're going to see if they can go the distance as uh, Rebel. Go ahead and have you joining us as well. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be a fun day. Academy Finals, Academy World Finals. We're, we're the best in the world at Academy because we just ha so happen to have the only Academy League, which is always nice to be able to call ourselves the champions. Uh, I didn't world know we had Ned Flanders hosting us today. That's that's pretty <laughs> nice. Uh, I actually won on both sides because we have Sweater on one side and we have Haddley Doodley on the other. So I'm just with a, a desk of Flanders, I suppose. You're just stuck between Perfect. the two of us for the rest of the day, Rebel. But before we get on to all the cool stuff we got to talk about today, we got to take a look at our Samsung Fast Five on how we're going to take a look at the, all these players throughout the regular season. Cubby, is there anything that's jumping out to you about anybody that we see here? Uh, honestly, it's a lot of the names that we're not going to see today. It, it's been a, a great season of Academy, uh, seeing a lot of uh, names that have done a lot of great things. Diamond uh, moving from Academy to the LCS squad. Johnson. Uh, he moved to the Academy roster, but ha really made his mark and showed up. Unfortunately, though, most of these names are not in the finals today, as we do have the two teams remaining, C9 and Team Liquid, and we can see a couple of those names spread throughout these fast spots. Yeah, we do. I mean, like, Armeo is still competing with Kiel to try to get into that, like, sub-550 section, attempting to get that level <laughs> 6. One of my favorites also, watching Hayri and Copy today, that's a that's a lane to keep your eyes on, especially if they're trying to race for Fast Mythic. I always push every week that we see this, that, like, these players care about this at all, and I feel like they, they don't really care about trying to beat each other's stats. <laughs> but I would love to see a competition to see who could get more gold fluxed into their mid laner faster to make sure they can snag this Fast Mythic item. These are the only two competing anymore. Well, we know that this is the situation where if you can get these early game leads, it's going to be pretty good. And we also know how aggressive these teams can be. But again, we got to take a look at more of how we've been getting here so far. And let's take a look at the bracket because it has been a banger series of playoffs, guys. We've had so many games go the distance, haven't we, Rebel Fox? We really have. Uh, my favorite so far in the tournament was the reverse sweep. C9 in the first round up against EG, yeah. 4 seed versus 5 seed. Absolutely incredible to see them be able to reverse their fortune, come back against EG, who was kind of slamming them in the first couple of games, and then continue. And then to come out and be FlyQuest on top of that was really impressive. That's the one seed they came out as the four, not favored in the slightest. Able to take that one as well. C9 has really dramatically shifted from their time inside of the regular season to just being this dominant force inside of playoffs, making their way to finals. And for Team Liquid, securing that second seed, I know, was so significant to them. Uh, I was on the game and uh, talking with Ayla when they got Armeo and Jenkins both back in the roster. And I was to ask players, you know, before a match, like, hey, is there anything else you want to share that you want to have mentioned on broadcast? Uh, and what Ayla left me with is, the boys are back, like the sunglasses emote. So he's really excited. He, he was very thankful for the subs and the time that players like Dokla and Anori have put into Help Team Liquid secure that second seed as it is a team effort, but I know that he's really excited to be back with the five players that they played with in the spring. And for Team Liquid and C9, this feels like the best of five that we were never able to get in the spring because these were the top two teams that we had the spring split of Academy, and it's been great to watch them really fight through their own struggles and perform to get back into the finals and give us the best five that we were wanting in the spring and are now wanting now. We were robbed in spring, you guys. We had an opportunity. They were looking so good, but we only got a best of one the entire time between them. And then, unfortunately, Team Liquid didn't have a very strong Proving Grounds performance, so they never got to play Cloud9 later on. But now that we have these rosters on our screen, we get to see a little bit more of is the rosters that we've been used to seeing. Obviously, Team Liquid has shifted a little bit. Cloud9 has shifted a little bit. But they seem to have cemented their play styles a little bit more now that we have actually gotten towards the end of playoffs. So... Kabi, I'm going to come to you first. I know we were looking at how these teams are playing, and they are fairly drastically different. What do you got for me? Uh, so, starting off on the side of Team Liquid, we have a little bit less tape on them, but I know that that series versus 100 Thieves, uh, they definitely took some junglers that are going to scale a little bit more. I know that Armeo did have two plays on the Nocturne, a jungler that hey, you want to get that level 6 to really have a big impact on the map, but 
they were averaging a, a gold deficit over 1500 gold at 15 against 100 thieves and uh i rebel i know that you felt like tl kind of snuck that series under the noses of 100 thieves because they did get pretty far behind in those early games yeah i mean not only in game one was 100 thieves literally on their nexus towers fighting when they got drawn off the first time and then it happened a second time before it ended up swapping back to team liquid but even in game three that was a really close one that they ended up flipping on one excruciatingly well set up team fight off the back of ayla and armea who was able to work on that nocturne and the rail combination to get into a proper team fight it feels like team liquid had to really heavily bank on that five on five being that oh, kind yeah. of lich pin for their comp into 100 thieves and it did work for them and we'll see if C9 can actually cause them fits here because obviously like were it not for that spectacular like the boys back in town type uh, synergy that they had for the five on fives maybe 100 Thieves is a you know the, the team that's here in this finals right here and right now and I was on that series actually it was honestly so crazy watching the back and forth and as you guys have already brought up how dominant 100 Thieves were early on in the game uh, this is one of these stylistic matchups that I said was going to be rather difficult last time I was on the desk because Cloud9 have really shown that they've been rather strong early game kind of across the board with how much veterancy they have but I know we got to pay a little bit more attention to where all of our individual strong players on and Rebel I know you really wanted to have an opportunity to talk about Jenkins versus Darshan up here in the top lane. Yeah, um, these are two incredible players for a number of reasons. Cubby has a lot more kind of in-depth, uh, you know, talking experience. I just want to set up the fact that, like, Jenkins has been around since, like, the first Proving Grounds, second Proving Grounds, that area. He's been in Academy and has slowly kind of crept his way, getting closer and closer to being one of the top laners that I would love to see in LCS just because of how talented. Got to sneak in for a couple of games for Team Liquid here. Had some okay performances as well. Uh, so it's like the veterancy is there. No longer is he like this young kid who came out of like the developmental system that we had established. Now he is the veteran who's coming in. And when you talk about veterancy, I don't think there's a name that goes further than Darshan inside of the academy split. And, you know, for both of these players, it really feels like they are, especially now that Kumo is playing with the FlyQuest main roster, they are the two strongest top laners that we have in academy. And this is a mental. Darshan has always felt like it's been, he's been a top three top laner. Uh, in Academy, in his role with uh, how skilled he is, is not only is he uh, the president of the Player Association, but also trying to be the president of the top lane as well. But the thing that's really interesting about these two players is that they've definitely adapted their own play style and will use that in this set to try and win as Jenkins, known for his GP, his Kennen, uh, his AP champions, he's able to play in the top lane, and now more recently as well, his Camille. Whereas Darshan has still really been making a name for himself on Nar and actually showing a few more split pushers, uh, returning to really some of his roots back, thinking of like the Team Coast, uh, GGU and Dig Days, right? Playing the split pushers, playing uh, a little bit of Fiora, Lucian, and even pulling out a Shen that did help C9 clutch out that game five versus EG. And I, I think that given just the caliber of these two players that we have in the top lane, that's really where my eyes go immediately in this matchup. Well, a couple of things pop out there. One, you mentioned the fact that Darshan has been playing a lot of NAR. For anybody who's been paying attention to the amateur scene as well as the academy, we saw yesterday TSM Academy's Haunter really heavily NAR. prioritized NAR. You were on yeah. that cast, Cubby. You know how brutal that was. But Jenkins, Darshan, we might see it from Darshan. I don't can't remember the last time I actually saw it from Jenkins. But of course, these guys aren't the only players on the Rift. Who else do we have your eye on, Dean? Uh, so for the side of C9 at least, um, a lot of my attention goes towards the, you know, what does their early game engine look like? We talked about how Team Liquid will bank on later in the game, playing for 5 on 5s, things like that, especially the early deficit they found out themselves on. So Shurnfire, gonna pull some of my attention to start with, but the bigger eye I've got is actually on Copy. Copy is very accustomed to playing towards the remainder of his team, helping set up Shurnfire for some of the early plays, even in some of the series. Uh, I know we, I talked to Smacks, who was able to cover the previous series. He said that Copy was honestly the MVP of the series up against the side of FlyQuest, and I don't disagree with him whatsoever. He was incredible inside of that series, has picked up the play dramatically from the middle of the split, where it seemed like he had some like comfort issues when it came to like the meta at the time. The current meta suits him excruciatingly well so my eyes on copy in this one to help out that early game all right well we do have to pay attention to everybody we have an opportunity to look more at the rest of the players later but we got to get real quick into what our predictions actually are as this is academy world finals i'm going to start with you cubby who do you got team liquid 3-1 i think that the true finals were team liquid versus 100 thieves and tr are going to be favored coming into the day rebel 
I'm gonna call C932. I actually have a lot of respect for Copy. Ooh. I think that King's got enough in the engine to uh, take that five on five. I think C9 can do it. And I know I'm just the host, but we gotta have an opportunity to look at it. I think it's gonna be a really close series, but the fact that Team Liquid are on the blue side, I think are actually gonna be the ones who are going to pull it out. We've seen how close okay. all these other series have been recently. So, the fact that Team Liquid have side selection is gonna be a pretty good start. Uh, it has been a rather long series overall to actually look at things, and as we're starting to get ready for draft, uh, it sounds like we might have a little bit more time. So, Cubby, I know you wanted to take a look about some of the other players, but I'm getting word from production that we got to jump right into it. So, Rafa, Crumbs, going to be your gentleman on the cast. Take it away. Thank you so much, Mr. Howard, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is Game 1 of the Academy World Finals. It is your boy, Mr. Rafa and Mr. Crumbs, a.k.a. El Profeto. <laughs> what do you have in your crystal ball for today's series, man? I think we got a banger, Rafa, because yeah. both these teams just played five-game series the whole way through. Cloud9's already got two in the tank, while Team Liquid Academy barely clutched out a win against 100 Thieves, holding on so many times. And I think what showed us is that both these teams have very tough mentals. Their resilience to taking a tough loss yes. is bar none. That is why they are here. They had to face that Game 5 looking down the barrel of potential elimination so many times that I think that these teams know that it's going to be a long one and they're probably just going to try to grind them out, try to see if they can use their advantage and experience in these long series to try to get an advantage against your opponent because oftentimes in these series, in these long playoffs, endurance is such a strong aspect of the teams that win. Yeah, not only endurance and the resilience that you talked about between both of these teams being tested, but also, even though that there has been a meta that we have seen within the regular season playoffs and going into this finals, sometimes a mini meta develops within the series as both teams start to understand which champion picks actually become stronger priorities, even if it defies what the meta is saying. And we've got a last band coming up from Cloud9. Already a couple of power picks. The Ziggs, if you remember notably, that EG game four against Cloud9. King being able to stall out until the very late game. Not going to have it for him today as Team Liquid are looking to lock in Aphelios for the first pick. This is going to be a good one because Aphelios, you always watch out for how much damage he's going to do in the late game. You can count on the game dragging on and then you'll be able to just burst everybody down from really long range. And the rest is still open. So there's still opportunities for Ayla to have that pick. Whereas Cloud9, I think their bands are already telling us it's going to be more of a Darshan show. And so far, it gets pretty exciting because not a lot of people are playing Fiora, especially Fiora with Ignite in the top lane, which is mm -hmm. so intensive in trading and just dominating lane and winning in those split pushes. So by banning out Jenkins' two most comfortable picks that we've seen thus far, it's telling me Cloud9 wants to attack the top side, maybe wants to continue to go in with a split push route, transition into team fights later. But Team Liquid is just saying, listen, we learned what we happened in against 100 Thieves. <laughs> we knew these games are going to go long. We're going to take the most powerful late game AD carry right now to ensure we have power when it gets to that stage. Yeah, notably for both of these teams, the, their earlier games were more on the struggling side in their respective semifinal series against FlyQuest and Evil Geniuses. It came down to that resilience towards the late game, being able to stall out the games for so long. It makes complete sense that Cloud9 and Team Liquid are already opting in to stronger carries that uh, get stronger and stronger the later the game goes. Aphelios and Viego, respectively, on both sides. Armeo, this is kind of his flavor of the metaphor, his jungle pick in the Trundle. He was kind of one of the first junglers to pick it up. A few other Academy junglers have picked it up along the way, but Armeo, kind of the, the innovator for the Trundle pick. I feel like Armeo has fused his Trundle gameplay with Santorin over at Team Liquid because that game five against 100 Thieves, going for a level two cheese is something that Santorin would always do on FlyQuest Academy when it, mm -hmm. FlyQuest when it really mattered and it worked out. So he had a deathless game that just crushed it last time around. I'm expecting big things out of him here. All usually shines in Academy Ooh. and you're already up against a Nautilus. So you're gonna actually have a really viable target because even if Nautilus falls behind, he's gonna proc the Aftershock. You ult him once that happens. So now you actually have a strong tank, a strong carry, a really good blind pick top lane, and a crazy team fight to peel back. So Team Liquid is going all out in the 5v5. Let's see where Cloud9 responds because this Lucian early, Silly Flex top, Rafa Darshan can right. throw down the gauntlet and say, I'll take the Lucian into GP. 
I mean, Crumbs, we saw in week three when he got that pinnacle, uh, Darshan's first yeah. career pinnacle ever on the Lucian. It's so insane. And we know that this can be, as you said, flex between Copy and Darshan. Cloud9 already are trying to take away some powerful blind pick mid lanes against Harry. So my suspicion is that this Lucian is already kind of slotted in for Darshan and they want to give counter pick priority over to Copy in the mid. That's so funny. You mentioned Darshan's pinnacle because he had, I think, the most exciting place for a top laner this split. That was one of them, but I still remember the 1v4 Lee Sin in yeah. the bot lane just <laughs> killing everyone. I don't know how it happens, but this man continues to find plays that just no other top laner is currently pulling off. And so that's part of what Lucian is. It's a champion that no one else is really playing. It's pretty difficult to pilot, quite slippery. It's a fine matchup into the gangplank, but it will demand so much attention to that top lane. Everybody knows they'll have to path up there because Lucian has to overextend and the Gangplank will be low and at turret, so he's going to be viable for a dive. Cloud9 could be looking to be really aggressive here because you already know you're not team fighting against a failure's Trundle GP, right? You've lost that battle already, <laughs> so you've got a hard pivot into something else that works and playing through topside is something that has gone well for them before. Having an adept split pusher in Lucian, if you, it is accelerated, and the gangplank can never join the team fights. And yes, you have Barrage to join, you know, unofficially with uh, from global power. But something that is actually interesting here, Crumbs, is that Cloud9 are getting a read that this Trundle can still be flexed to Ayla in the support role because they have took out the Xin Zhao. Yeah, that's a good read. Nice call. Trundle support is a thing now. And. Well, he was the thing before, and usually against really tanky champions like the Leona, but the Nautilus works really well too. So that's a nice one, right? Recognizing that this could also be flex and that our male still has options is really interesting because now both teams, with that in mind, have multiple flex roles. Cassiopeia, probably a mid laner. Diego, and then that would put the Lucian into the top, but you could always send them to the bottom and if you just want to go with lane dominance. And it won't be Trundle into the support role it will be into the jungle which i like despite the viability into the nautilus armeo had such a good game you gotta give the players that are shining give him the champion again give him the opportunity to pop off now this cassiopeia is interesting because you you have relatively short range uh, uh from side of team liquid uh, leblanc i guess is the only person that and have somewhat longer range if you're able to come over from uh, long walls and flanks with that distortion. But the Lee Sin for Copy in the mid lane, which means we're getting King Cassiopeia in the bottom lane. Crumbs, this is this is nuts for game one. They just flipped it. Now, Harry wanted LeBlanc into Cassio because it's pretty tough for Cassiopeia, right? She's not movable. She's never going to land the stun against her. And so immediately swaps the Cassio to the bot. Now it's Lee Sin. Now, as LeBlanc, you don't really like this matchup because Lee can burst you, right? He's got ways to track your clone. You can get instantly kicked into the team. This is not as easy as Harry would have liked this matchup to be. So Cloud9, with a curveball, ends with what I think are two winning solo lanes out. The Lucian's going to do fine into the Gangplank, the Lee as well. So Cloud9 is just going to try to win early and smash from there, not give Team Liquid a chance. Uh, uh, Shurnfire and Copy are looking to link up early on into the game, try to use this pressure from Copy's Lee Sin. And I, I imagine that if, if you're able to get Copy out of the lane pretty early on against this LeBlanc, I'm, I'm seeing two beelines from both Shurnfire and Copy towards the top side of the map. Snowball that lead into Darshan's pockets, try to get him accelerated. And then, like you said, Crumbs, you have a very, very uh, potential 1-3-1 with both Lucian and Lee Sin on the sidelines. And the matching for Team Liquid is going to be pretty rough. Now, I think you're spot on in that you got to go top. You just got to keep pressuring this area because Aphelios with a Braum is not that easy to kill. Or if he has the red gun, there's an exhaust. There's a lot of shielding and peeling that can go down with these champions. So you're better off just trying to continue to punish Jenkins. And I think Jenkins had a somewhat weaker laning phase in the series against 100 Thieves. So this could be an opportunity for Cloud9 to test the waters and see what's going on with the top lane. Is this a point where they could play towards? Because these first games always determine so much. Darshan taking the Lucian into the Gangplank from a single game can determine if this is going to be something that they can do. Are they going to be able to just play Lucian into Gangplank every single time? If so, now it seems like we can't blind that. But if he loses against it, oh, now it's rough for Cloud9 because he mm -hmm. threw two bands at Jenkins. He took the GP and still beat you on their counter matchup. So you got to 
throw out your early plan and come up with something new, and you only have like five minutes to do so. So this matchup will be so important for Cloud9. You know, Crumbs, the only time I've ever seen a Gangplank actually beat the Lucian in the 1v1 matchup was from Niles back in the semi-pro scene last year when he was on Maryville, and he was playing against Tenacity on the 100 Thieves' next roster. They they sc they scouted out the GP, picked the Lucian, and Gangplank level 1 kind of beat uh, Tenacity's head in. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that Darshan is not going to fall to the same uh, level of disrespect on the level 1, as Trial by Fire is a hell of a passive to have with the Burning True damage, but I'm... I'm curious to see how Shurnfire and Armee are going to be reacting in their pathing towards the top side of the map because we've seen three wave crashes, we've seen earlier ganks or cheese ganks as well. Have oh, here it is. Oh, what's up? He's cheesing him. Armeo red to top. Red to top. He's on oh. the way. Oh, Darshan. Oh, if you watch him hit level two and dash in, Armeo's about to kill him. Oh, he doesn't know. And Darshan going know. for the River Ward instead, but now he's going to get bamboozled. He's only level one. He only has Piercing Light. Darshan is just going to try to go for the one wing one against Jenkins. Armeo now running away. What? He gets out. J Jenkins gave it away. Jenkins gave it away. Darshan was suspicious, but then Armeo was so eager to go for it that Darshan just walks around it. That was really well played by him. The patience necessary to know that he could just walk towards Jenkins, and Trundle can't do anything about it, right? If Trundle commits a flash, well, or Darshan just flashes away. So really smartly played by him. This is the kind of knowledge you need if you're going to be playing these matchups where you know jungle attention is going to be so important from both junglers, and it's also good prep. You saw how 100 Thieves fell to this gank in game five. But now the ball is on Shurnfire's court. You're ahead of the trundle. What can you do with it? And Shurnfire gets to reap the rewards off of that. Being up, up ahead, solid two camps now against Armeo because he spent so much time trying to make this gank work. I, he's not quite level four yet, but he just needs one more camp. Shurnfire is going to try to contest this. Copy doesn't have mid prio, however, so Armeo will be able to claim this, this grab. As Shurnfire is just going to wait and... Try to get pressure for Darshan so he can push in the wave safely. I think it worked out for TL at the end of the day. GP's even and far. Armeo is able to catch the scuttle because Harry and Jenkins were still healthy in their lane. And he's going to get double scuttles because the bot lane is also shoving. So mm. this is unlike all of the TL games against 100 Thieves. They're actually doing really well in the early game. And with a comp that hard out scales, it's looking good. Now Cloud9 are going to have to find ways of being able to accelerate uh, this early game. Shurnfire, it's not, it's not a bad thing to get levels onto Viego as, you know, having access to level 6 with Heartbreaker gives you a little bit extra mobility and uh, potential for uh, easier execution of those resets. And Machine Power Spike now available gives him a ton of skirmishing power against Team Liquid's composition. The new play I'm looking at from is how do these teams set up for the first Dragon of Ooh, so the first dragon, I think Cloud9 really wants to prioritize these objectives because you want to force the team composition at a TL to fight you before they have the full itemization. So they need to free up the bot lane, get Cassiopeia in a position where she can start wave clearing quickly. And once she can outpush Gion and Ayla, then the Nautilus can start roaming and your setup for dragon is there. But look at how much Team Liquid has been pushing this lane. It's getting really rough to fight back because King... He's already running low on mana. He doesn't have enough to go for a big trade, which means that Yon and Ayla can continue to harass, knowing that, hey, there's just Oom. Um, they're running too low on mana to legitimately threaten the kill, so they can continue to do this all day, knowing their sight. Ooh, this is a huge wave being built up by Jenkins. Armeo is also here to pressure Darshan. Still no flashes. Double TPs are being answered. Darshan flashing over the wall. Here he comes in. Might be a little too late as Copy is able to answer the response, ensuring that Darshan does not go down. Well played out of both teams. It's a good response out of Cloud9. And also Team Liquid knowing that there is an opportunity to punish Darshan if the TP doesn't come through, that Lucian is dead. And if Lucian falls behind, he's not coming back because Jenkins is actually going for a really smart itemization. He's going for the Ninja tab ice, but it, look, he's waiting in the brush and he might be baited if Poppy stays here, but he doesn't. He actually backs off. Never mind. Some action on to the bottom side of the map. I don't think really... Just light trading between both of the lanes as Yon and Ayla are still fighting for control as Darshan has lingered a little around too much longer. Shurn fires here for reinforcements. Armeo and Jenkins trying to hold this position of this wave state, but Shurnfire and Darshan are going to be able to successfully push it in so it doesn't freeze. 
So I was mentioning how critical Jenkins' itemization here is going to be, because at the beginning of the game, we started talking about how they wanted to camp up, how rotations from mid to top would be really important here. But Jenkins itemizing with the tab eyes early means that all three champions from Cloud9's top lane are going to deal significantly less damage, which will buy him so much time. So it's a really smart move. And now they're going to try to punish Darshan, but he just has dash. That's a bit of a misplay. And that's a huge uh, ability being wasted on to uh, for a potential pick. You you will no longer have the cannon barrage for the next uh, dragon fight if it comes up in about the next minute or so. Both teams are just trying to burst top open, but they're both reacting really well. So they know that once this starts to swing with gold one way, it's gonna be over. Jenkins still has flash on fire, gets the flash out, and ensures that Darshan is able to maintain a summoner and our pressure as Darshan did have to burn the Flash earlier. Now both of these top laners don't have sums. The top laners are dodging a lot of these ganks really well. You know, you could say that the junglers are being pretty desperate forcing these ganks, but they know how important these top laners are to their respective win conditions. So you can't really blame them for being so aggressive to try to find some action here. And top laners are playing pretty well, knowing that they were going to be the focus of this matchup. And you just know that when the matchup is Gangplank into the Lucian, it's something that we've seen throughout the year in Academy where top winners are just loving to play the carry, something that no other league really does quite as much. But they know that if you don't put attention to this lane, you've just lose from draft. So both teams know how volatile this was going to be. They're playing really well around it. In the next 40 seconds, Crumbs, the first Rift Horn. Uh, not sorry, not 30 seconds, 3 seconds, I should say. Rift Herald has spawned on the map. So far, neither Team Liquid or Cloud9 have made huge moves or preparations to move for that objective, the Zarmeo. Position on the bottom side of the map, hoping to guide Jan and Ayla into pushing this bot wave, might set up for the first dragon of the game. The bot lane for TL. You know, they haven't done that much this game, but just by pushing the lane so much, it's locked Isles into the lane. So a Nautilus that is just laning is not doing anything. And this means that Team Liquid can get an early dragon. They're going to be loving this because if they can start to stack dragons, then they get more team fights. And just by denying it, it means that they can buy themselves even more time if this game were to drag on into the matchup. So getting these early dragons from what the bot lane is doing just by laning is something that is going to really help them out. And you almost wonder, was this worth it with the pick of the Cassiopeia into the bottom lane to forego the early lane so that you could get the Lee Sin matchup into the LeBlanc? Because the Lee hasn't really done that much either. So I feel like this is a trade that Cloud9 will have to reconsider again since while King can play a lot of mages, he usually looks a lot more dominant on the AD carries. Or even if you uh, try to even go to the oddball picks of Zed Targ that we saw a few weeks ago as well. I mean, that, that was sick. But I, I'm definitely in the same boat with you as Crumbs. Hang on a marksman that he can really take over the game with. It gives him a little bit more freedom. But something that we missed is that Team Liquid had a ward on to this Rift Herald. The Surefire tried to sneak it while Armeo was already on the bottom side of the map but because it spots him out. He doesn't have the pressure to be able to go for it. And Team Liquid immediately answered by just e-lining it to this. And now both of the first neutral objectives have been secured by Team Liquid in a matchup where the later the game goes, they are favored. That's a big deal for these guys. So that's already showing. I think Armero's having a pretty good game. He's only fallen 10 CS behind to the Viego, but already has put a lot of pressure onto the matchup. Darshan knows that if he's ever trying to dash aggressively, there might be a Trundle showing up. The LeBlanc could free up her some time and show up into that lane as well. So that means that if the Lucian isn't playing as aggro as he would like to be, he's not gaining a CS lead into the Gangplank. And so the Lucian pick just kind of fizzles because now you have a Gangplank versus a Lucian and the Gangplank's going to be so much more effective in a teamfight scenario. So the jungler of a Trundle, which is normally a more supportive style pick. When you do get fed, the Divine Sunder can be a carry, but if it's just a normal game, not a scrim looking like game where you're just killing everybody all over the map, you know you'll still have value. So you can forego your early to make sure that your laners survive. And thus far, Armeo's doing a fine job at doing that. Armeo is falling behind in terms of camp experience and gold. But I think considering that the amount of pressure that he's able to use for that sacrifice to deflect all of the dives 
attempts that Cloud9 want to go for. You even see that Compi, every time he looks for a roam to the top side, Harry immediately is able to respond right back while not dropping a beat on the CS. Team Liquid have been playing a great early game so far. Cloud9 though, Shurnfire might have the edge on Jenkins, still no flash. Cleanse early comes out, no oranges available either, and Darshan will pick up first blood. Really good timing out of C9. Look at the flash on Jenkins in the top left of your screen. It was about 10 seconds from coming back up. So Cloud9 timed it from the earlier gang from Shurnfire and then responds to it when he's trying to push the wave. While Armeo was nowhere close, he was spotted with the two wards that Lee Sam was able to put, so they knew there wasn't going to be a counter gank. And now Team Liquid's trying to force something. They're trying to get something in return. The best they can do is get the Rift Herald and maybe get some damage onto the turret, but I don't think they can commit for this. The Cassiopeia is now fairly strong, so it's just going to be some more gold to the Aphelios. I still think that's a win for Cloud9, since now the Lucian can get rolling. Got a solid 1,000 gold lead for Cloud9 at 12 minutes into the game's crumbs. It's not the accelerated start that Cloud9 were hoping for, but you still have some time to try and get things rolling for both of your side, uh, your solo laners here in this Lee Sin and the Lucian so they can start dominating the side lanes and setting up for that 1-3-1 that we were talking about at the beginning of the draft. Team Liquid, though, have been not only maintaining complete objective control over the first dragon and the first Rift Herald, the second dragon is about to spawn in the next minute. Cloud9 are starting to hit some very powerful mythics, though. Uh, once the Eclipse from Darshan comes out, I think that'll be the scariest one for me. Cassiopeia already has her, but we haven't really seen her be that active on the map. And it's going to be pretty tough for her to actually deal damage here because there's a lot of targets that want to kite you away. Only our male will really be in front of Cassiopeia to hit. So that's simply one target, whereas Solution against a lot of range picks that won't be stacking armor, well, that's really going to do a lot with the lethality. So I do think that this early spike can be beneficial for Cloud9. And then what we hit early. It's going to be an explosive early game out of them. They're trying to explode the game here, but we've seen how well Team Liquid can hold on when they have these comps through an early goalie. So just falling a little bit behind here, falling a little bit behind in CS just doesn't mean much to this team who has been so good at holding on and knowing where they're strong. Shurnfire is really the only outlier when it comes to uh, CS advantages for the side of Cloud9. As we talked about before, Armeo gave up a lot of time and pressure to ensure that Jenkins was protected for a majority in the top side while also gaining map control. But this is the first time that Cloud9 are able to get first shove over the bottom side of the map as Armeo is also trying to be a nuisance in Darshan, but Cloud9 get the second dragon of the game. He just tried to gank him again, but Darshan doesn't even have to burn the flash for that. He's also pretty tanky going with the Ninja Tabais himself, so that's a worth trade for Cloud9 again. You just saw the Trundle show up, you got the Dragon, and you didn't even have to burn a flash for it. In fact, he doesn't even have to leave the lane. So Team Liquid is just thinking, we are not strong right now. We just cannot take these fights. We know that Cloud9 will beat us in a composition or before at this early game, even with the Gangplank Ultimate, if we can get him to use that and the Lucian doesn't TP, but it's just not worth it. We know we scale, and I love seeing that because so many times, early comps just fight and ask for a fight, and the team that scales thinks, oh yeah, yeah, we need to take a fight. They want to fight. Why shouldn't we? They forget their own win con. Sean's doping the hurt onto Jenkins while this wave is slightly pushing into him. But Darshan to be able to thin out the wave a little bit, setting up for Shurnfire to potentially move into the top side of the map. Armeo getting right under Compi in the mid lane. And this gives Shurnfire a little bit of time to either get some vision control or be able to sneak a, a camp away if he can manage it. I took the blue. That's a pretty big deal. Now, it wasn't going to go to Armeo, but it was going to go to the LeBlanc. And so LeBlanc with blue would have been able to shove copy in and then roam to the side so this steal ends up helping the side lanes more and this is why you gotta help your jungler out when he's going for these buff steals he's trying to help you out just help your jungler he'll help you out back guys it's the role is meant to help the lanes don't spite your jungler he's just trying to work for the team something to, to notice here crumbs both ayla and Isles. i think this is the first time They've been had a chance to really been outside of their lane as they're setting up for this next Rift Herald. Isles is going to be first here on the play, while, or I should say Ayla is going to be the first one here, while Isles is still walking from base. 
Surefire trying to stall as much time as he can, but the pressure of King also being here while Copy is sent to split on the side lane since he has teleport, you can ensure that Cloud9 get the second Rift Herald this time around. They have a lot of vision to Cloud9 with the double control wars on the left side of mid and the pixel. And you get the first turret, which is a worth trade, especially since it's solo XP and gold going over to the Aphelios. But that is Team Liquid once again seeing Cloud9 wants to fight and we don't. We're getting something on the map. Let's back it up and just give this one over. I think they would have really lost that fight. You don't want to be going into this Cassiopeia early without enough vision to know where the team is at because someone has to walk into her, someone has to do that, and it's going to be either Ayla or Armeo, and neither can stand up to her at this stage. Thanks to the gold charts, we see that Shurnfire still has that massive lead, about almost just under a 1,000 over Armeo. And, you know, for Trundle, you, you, you build this under, and then you, you kind of just go uh, off bruiser tank stats afterwards. Your, your real job in the later the game goes is to be a pillar bot and try to sap the tankiest member on the side of Cloud9, which is going to be Isles, but Shurnfire. Carry like Viego can be the difference maker the later the game goes, as you said, Darshan, uh, from, like, for Team Liquid, they have so much potential late game damage in this Gangplank and in this Aphelios, but that's a target that Viego can just pick up once they assassinate. It's like, ah, now I'm the Gangplank, I'm the Aphelios, I have your carry now. I'm glad, I'm so glad you bring up the elephant in the room that is Viego, because we have seen playoffs games for a few weeks now, and Viego is an absolute X-Factor. You scale, oh, now you're the Aphelios. You have all his items, now you scale. So, sure and fire can absolutely be the carry force that Cloud9 needs in this game to just bring them to a strong late game. So this is something that Team Liquid has to focus fire. I think that's the key. We've seen how teams beat it. The second he pops up, throw everything at him. You just cannot allow a single reset to happen when you are trying to be a late game team. If he turns into an Aphelios with four items into this game, your team is dead, so you gotta focus <laughs> down Shurn Fire. And uh, if you don't, then you just get reset cityed and you lose. That's it. That's the nature of Viego. We know what happens. There's no use complaining about it. You just gotta play against it. And Team Liquid let it happen for a reason. They let the Viego through. They gotta have a plan against it. They got the champions to do so. I think a single Braum tag with Trundle Pillar and Sap with LeBlanc and Ophelius focusing him down should be enough to pop. Yeah, the key for Cloud9 will be to look for isolated picks, right? Because the more the open the field is for Team Liquid, they have a lot of zone control between Cannon Barrage, Barrels, and Pillar from Armeo, that you can create a lot of space for Yon to really just potentially take over fights as long as he's not getting flanked by this Lee Sin or this Lucian. The Rift Arrow play, though, from Cloud9 onto the bottom side of the map not only nets a turret, but also gives them pressure needed to get the third Dragon of the game. It is a Cloud Soul. So important cooldowns like Petrifying Gaze and Dragon's Rage are going to be up again. Speaking of Dragon's Rage, Copy finds Jenkins onto the bot side of the map. Doesn't look like it's going to be a quick kill anytime soon. Just a little pressure as he lands another Sonic Wave. But Rift Herald will get one more crash. Not going to take the turret anytime soon. Knows that Jenkins still has oranges. So he knows the, the vitamin C is always available to heal him <laughs> back up. So he backs up. He knows that he just wants to get that Rift Herald crash. Because if he finds another opportunity where GP is not in lane, then he can take the tier two. So he's just trying to get himself set up to get more gold. And those tier twos are really important because Cloud9 wants to blow the game wide open and find flanking angles, especially for the Lee Sin. You got to be able to strike from multiple directions when you're dealing with these comps with an Aphelios that want to fight front to back. So I like that out of copy, just getting some chunk, not overextending. But he's going to have to stay down in that lane to get value out of that earlier Herald crash. Looks like they're going to swap up the lane allocations here as Copy is heading towards the top side of the map. This will prep Darshan to be splitting on the bottom side of the map against Jenkins. Baron is up on the table, but I don't necessarily think that Cloud9 are in a position where they could have this Cassiopeia sneak it with Shurnfire and Isles. I know we've seen in past iterations of League of Legends where you could run something like Nunu Azir or Nunu Cassiopeia and you could just, you know, burn down this thing because Cassiopeia does a ton of sustained damage. Not sure what it's like with this setup between the Demonic Embrace and Leandri's Torment as it is a lot of percentage HP and damage and more the health stacks come in from Team Liquid, the better it's going to benefit them. I don't 
know if Cloud9 are willing to throw a Hail Mary like that anytime. So they can do it. And I don't think it could be a... So if they do it without the proper circumstance, it is absolutely a Hail Mary. But if you do okay. it right, it is free. And here we go. Trundle is gonna die. Well, not quite. Thanks to Subjugate, he's gonna be able to sap all of Isle stats. He gets caught up by the Gravitum, a beautiful pillar. Doesn't get followed up by Team Liquid as the Darshan TP is enough to zone them away from the further fight. And Crumbs, I think we gotta talk about how tense it feels between both of these teams because it's been 21 minutes. First Blood occurred around the 15 minute mark. Both of these teams are taking this series so seriously because they know how much is on the line. Team Liquid is putting Cloud9 in a tough position, I think more than Cloud9 is feeling. So the tension, I think, rests more on Cloud9 because Team Liquid is saying, yeah, you know what? We're okay with just throwing the entire game on a single team fight. We don't care about trying to scrap early. We got our early dragon. It's going to mm -hmm. take a while. We want that one fight. Baron, game is over, and that is it. While Cloud9 is trying to build leads here and there, trying to scrap for it, but Team Liquid is just not giving them anything. And that feels really frustrating because you have the champions that needed to find those plays. And right there, they looked for whatever they could find. But they're fishing. They're throwing out hooks to see whoever is there. It's our male, the tankiest member on TL, and they can't pop him. So that feels bad because you burn some flashes for it. But Cloud9 needs to find an avenue to kill somebody. It's just that the champions that Team Liquid has and the way they're playing it makes it really difficult for Cloud9 to actually get the pick they want. And so it feels so much worse for them since they know late game Aphelios is coming and there's not a lot of targets that can easily eliminate him. Cloud9 are kind of at a range of disadvantage when it comes to trying to fight into Aphelios. As you said before, Aphelios thrives in a front-to-back team fight as it, it's so hard as Cassiopeia and Lucian to get through Rom and a Trundle when they are stacked up against each other. Surefire, oh no. He does have Flash. Nice. Killer comes out. He's going to use the Heartbreaker instead. Maintains the Flash Summoner advantage, but they follow up with the Glacial Fissure. Has to finally Flash over the wall. Still is surviving, but Armeo is still on the chase. If Pillar comes back up, he could be in a world of trouble. Harry looking forward to Distortion play. Flashing forward. Sigil of Malice, not going to be enough damage. That was so close. They really committed for that because a kill there is barren for TL. Mm. That's White Gun on Aphelios. They might still try it if they think that the TP is going to take too long. But Poppy's going in. Team Liquid's going to start it. They're forcing it right now. They think that was the advantage they needed. Harry is waiting in the wings here. And Armeo and Yon are going to try to start whittling down this Baron. But between just the two of them, they're actually doing a quite a substantial amount of damage. 6,000 already HP on the Baron. King has to be able to form a Miracle Plate installing this one out. 4,000 on Baron. Schoenfrau still making his way over. He doesn't have Flash. They're just going to look for the play. Pillar's going to block it off. 1,500 on Baron. Schoenfrau cannot reach it. And Baron is secured for Team Liquid. And that's Ooh. a mega distortion from Harry as he just pops two people right off the backs of Cloud9. And the rest are running for the hills. Copy. He's gonna get routed off. Looks for a Kale. He goes. Gets Harry in the in the the crossfire. Ayla does find King. Copy. Can he sustain himself against our mail? He oh. smites the camp. Gets about a nice amount of HP. Copy is still living. He's buying time. This is Baron buff that is being potentially wasted. As Shurnfire is actually whittling down the dragon before the rest of Team Liquid can respond. Uh, he's gonna. He can't finish this. Oh, he has no. to get out. <laughs> ah, this game one is so tense. Dude, did you see the advantage that TL got? was a, just not even killing Shurnfire. It was just making him base. Just running him back into his own base and having the Aphelios with a white gun with a trundle right there was the advantage they used to just go for the game, to go for the jugular against Cloud9. Now they have the gold lead. They're going to be able to dominate the side lanes now, so the advantage that Cloud9 was banking on with these champions is null, and they can just burn towers after towers with the Aphelios, bring a gold lead that's big enough that Cloud9 will never be able to split push again and they'll have to team fight and that feels like a really tough position for Cloud9. I would like to see Shurnfire attempt to go for a steal but when you think about how he actually ended up escaping he had to burn the flash and the heartbreaker to get out so he didn't have a dash available and there was no blast cone so he had to go all the way around into the main entrance into the pit while there is a LeBlanc harassing him so TL really thought about what it was that they had gained from getting the Viego to run away. And that was such a smart call to go for the Baron because now look at how confident they are. All of a sudden, they're online and, and Cloud9 just doesn't know what to do. 
And the worst thing about for Cloud9 is what wave clear exists in this composition? Like Cassiopeia doesn't have the easiest time of being able to just delete waves. Most of the majority of her damage does come from Twin Fangs. You're going to have to bank on Noxious Gas to actually just dissipate waves, but that's not going to be the case, especially against up Baron Minions. You would have to almost burn Culling just to be able to dissipate waves as well, but when Culling is such a powerful poke tool, using it to clear waves feels bad for Cloud9, as this Siege is going to be so potential for Team Liquid. Oh, that's a turret, and Lucian is bottom, so they know that they're losing this out. I think Cloud9 are just going to have to be content with giving up this inhibitor. They're, they're stalling it out for as long as they can. Darshan is waiting to push out his advantage. Doesn't want to reveal if he has backed quite yet. Went for the red buff. As I think Cloud9 just accepted the fact that there's no way that you're going to be able to defend against the inhibitor push. Darshan is going to try to equalize. Going back to Roots Crumbs. The split push days of Darshan still trying to find another win con even when the odds are starting to come against Cloud9. Well, he got a turret and a red buff, but you lost the inhibitor top, and Team Liquid still have Baron, right? They can still go for these pushes, and now the gang comes in that push the bottom wave. Actually, the Baron just barely expired now. They weren't able to get the empowered recall, yet the advantage that they gained top, I still think is significant, if not for the inhibitor, for the fact that they just are stronger. Uh, Trundle can get out of this. Yeah, uh, Copy went for a insect flash play. But Armeo's just going to be fine as he burns Subjugate. Didn't have Flash, but the pick... I don't know if that was a desperation play from Cloud9 as they're feeling the pressure being down this much gold with the composition against them being a scaling and having a huge advantage at this point of the game, but... I don't know, Krubs. This is, yeah. <laughs> this if is there was ever a time to all chat question mark, that is one of them. Because that play is just <laughs> not going to work. It's Viego's right there. He doesn't have damage to take down. The Trundle, the LeBlanc, and the Felis are right there too. That actually is a pretty big deal. Because Yeon doesn't have Flash. Right? He doesn't have that spell. So there was an opportunity to kick Flash via Felios instead. But now with Lee Sin not having that, he's going to be safe. He knows he's going to have his ultimate and Flash coming back up. And so now the Aphelios is super fine to continue the team fight. He's got a stopwatch now. There's no chance that Cloud9 can actually get to him anymore. And Cloud9 with an inhibitor down is in a tougher position to split push. Because now they actually are split pushing simply to hold the wave, not to get an advantage on their own, which frees up Team Liquid to group up and get even more gold on the map. And considering Team Liquid were the composition that want to be able to either group as five or just send one split pusher in Harry, while the rest can team fight and have ad better advantages in being able to fight C9's four man or three man. All nine are just in dire waters at this point. The pressure of these turrets falling is starting to mount up. Team Liquid feeling extremely confident right now with their position at this point in the game. Oh. Another fight breaks out. Glacial Fissure is burned. Moonlight Vigil is also used as well. Cloud9 still holding strong as Harry looks for an assassination attempt, but Churnfire is equalizing the odds potentially. Copy! Oh, he kicked the clone! Unfortunate. They're still split pushing though. Cloud9 still have Lucian top. What is going on? That is a super inhibitor wave. They're gonna lose this creep. The Viego's not here to respond. I don't think Cloud9 can try to engage this. They'll lose this fight. LeBlanc's TPing. Harry's TPing back in. He's able to distortion out before the Miasma connects, so he's able to be safe in this back line. Team Liquid still have their five members. Culling comes out. Petrifying Gates flash from Ooh. King, though. Catches Ayla, but Harry responds against Sharnfire. That's a huge carry down. Miasma comes down, tries to slow down the opposition from being able to push forward, but Copy is routed off by Armeo. Cloud9, only three members to four. Team Liquid have the minions. Not going to be looking to end the game anytime soon, but get that last push in. Such a good kite back out of Team Liquid. And then Harry outplaying the Viego and the Lee Sin was huge. If he died, Team Liquid have to back off. And Baron is on the table. That could have actually been the opportunity for Cloud9 if they got that pick onto the LeBlanc. But instead, it's TL that get an inhibitor. And they can now turn to this because there's white red guns on Yeon. So there's no threat of a steal. It's another Baron. Two inhibs down. They know they can give up this dragon. It's not going to mean much. I think Cloud9 is with maybe three minutes left on this game if Team Liquid execute on this. Well, this Baron push is what Team Liquid is going to use to end the game. 7,000 gold lead for Team Liquid at 30 minutes into the game, Crumbs. And as we talked about it in the draft, huge scaling advantage. 
We don't want to discredit necessarily King on this Cassiopeia, who it looks like should have enough gold to finish this Void Staff. But I don't know if uh, late game Cassiopeia can do the same type of damage as a late game Ziggs. Yep. Doesn't feel quite the same. <laughs> It's a range difference, it, because Cassiopeia is amazing when champions are trying to dive into you, when tanks are trying to dive into you in particular. But who's diving on Team Liquid? You just saw how they played the fights. As long as they kite back, they outrange Cassiopeia. So her play pattern does not work against this composition, which only helps Team Liquid's scaling advantage here. And they're really starting to feel it, because now Harry can just go in, pop them, force a recall, and then the Aphelios is melting turrets. Last inhibitor turret will fall here, Crumbs. The top inhibitor has respawned, but with Team Liquid's proposition at this moment, they can always easily rotate over. Darshan gets a huge chunk out of Harry flashing forward. Chain is going to connect if he can get one more piercing light, Whoa. but Harry manages to trade. Team Liquid have equalized. Cloud9 does not have Darshan anymore. It's just four on four, and the way that this composition plays out, still a strong four man core for Team Liquid. Cannon Barrage is going to come out, slowing down King and sure fire Glacial Fissure lands. Petrifying Gates connects, but it's not going to be enough because Yawn just silences him with the Moonlight Vigil. Copy trying to be the last ditch hero play, but it's not going to be enough here, Crumbs. Game one will go over to Team Liquid. Methodical, calculated. This was how Team Liquid played this game. They never sweat. They knew they had the scaling advantage. They played to it the second they smelled blood in the water like a shark. They pounced on it, and Cloud9 could not come back. This was a really good showing out of Team Liquid. I think they learned a lot from their series against 100 Thieves, applied it here, and just completely nullified the top side. They knew what Cloud9 was trying to do, so that's good prep. And then once the Lucian did not get off to the ground, they just waited. They waited for Cloud9 to make that single mistake. And then the game was over. All credit to Team Liquid as they, like you said, the early game was super calculated and very reserved. They mitigated and nullified any advantages that Cloud9 were looking for. I know the first thing that's going to happen when we go back to the desk, they're going to talk about blue side is OP <laughs> because there, there's a stat in there about having like a 70% win rate across the regular season if you're a blue side, but... I, th there's obviously a lot more to talk about, and thankfully, I know the analyst desk will do a great job of breaking that down. When we come back, it's going to be Josh, Cubby, and Rebel Fox locking at Game 1.